We are going to continue on in Unit 3, and we'll finish up this note packet. Um, we're going to talk about Lewis structures, polarity, bond polarity, and then um, further polarity. And if that doesn't make sense right now, I hope it makes more sense after the lecture. Okay, so let's think about ionic bonds. Remember ionic bonds? Who participates in ionic bonds? What type of atoms? So it's usually metals to nonmetals, um, or any polyatomic ion. So remember that metals lose electrons and nonmetals gain electrons. So with ionic bonds, there's a real transfer of electrons. Um, I always liken it to a friendship where you, sometimes you have these friendships where you're constantly giving, and other times you may have friendships where you're constantly taking. So metals are constantly giving up their electrons to nonmetals. So that's kind of an, a not very balanced relationship, if you will. So other atoms are held together by sharing electrons. So um, a little bit more balanced and perhaps a more healthy relationship, if you think of it in terms of relationships. Um, remember on our periodic table, group one, two, and three, those are metals. Um, they lost electrons to become positively charged cations. And then groups five, six and seven gained electrons to become negatively charged anions, negative three, negative two, negative one. And then there was this kind of weird in-between group that I, that I said, don't worry about those. They don't form ions. They share electrons. So these are the atoms that share electrons. And we'll go into that further in this le uh, lecture. So sharing electrons, covalent bonds, um, result because of sharing electrons between two nonmetals. So if you look at water, ammonia, and methane, these are all held together by covalent bonds. So water is H2O, ammonia is NH3, methane is CH4, and they're all nonmetals. So um, on the right side of your periodic table, you have your nonmetals. These noble gases over here, they're just, they like to stay by themselves. They are very self-sufficient. They don't need to bond with anybody. They're real loners. Um, but the rest of the guys on the non metal side, guys and gals, if you want to assign that to these atoms, um, they share electrons. And hydrogen, even though hydrogen is over here in the metals, it actually is considered a non-metal. So a lot of times you can see in some classrooms on campus, there will be a hydrogen drawn here with atomic number one. So um, and you can't see what I'm drawing. Sorry about that. So sometimes on the periodic tables, you see this drawn over here. Um, so you consider hydrogen a nonmetal. So it's actually a nonmetal, not a metal. Now lithium is a metal. Hydrogen is not. OK, so back to water, ammonia, and methane. They all are held together by covalent bonds because they have nonmetals. So if you look at water, the electron dot diagram, or Lewis dot diagram, it looks like this. And this line that I have here actually represents two electrons. Okay? So oxygen and hydrogen are sharing those two electrons. And so unlike ionic compounds where a metal loses an electron and a nonmetal gains an electron, um, in this bond right here, they're sharing two electrons. And, it, you know, the Care Bears said it best, right? Sharing is caring. <laughs> um, 
do it seriously. Um, this is ideal, the sharing of electrons here, because every atom gets an octet, or this closest thing to an octet, so that it's happy. You know, Sesame Street told us eight is great. Um, so oxygen has two, four, six, eight electrons around it. Hydrogen is a minimalist. It does not want more than two electrons, and it has two electrons here, so it's happy. This hydrogen has two electrons here, and it's happy. So everybody has had its bonding requirements met, and so a covalent bond exists now. Now let's look at um, ammonia. So if you look, nitrogen is in group 5. And so this is what ammonia looks like. So again, these electrons are shared between nitrogen and hydrogen, nitrogen and hydrogen, nitrogen and hydrogen. Um, so high, or nitrogen has two, four, six, eight electrons around it. It's content. Um, hydrogen has two, which is all it needs. It's a minimalist. It does not want any more. Excess is confusing. Hydrogen two, hydrogen two. So it's happy. Let's go to methane. Methane looks like this. So four hydrogens, one carbon. And if you're wondering how I'm drawing these and you're thinking, I have no idea how to draw those, we're going to learn how to draw Lewis structures. So don't fret. Um, so each one of these lines represents two electrons. So carbon has two, four, six, eight electrons around it. It's happy. Carbon wants an octet. Eight is great. And the reason that is is, you know, every... Every atom is striving to be like a noble gas. Remember I told you those noble gas or, gases are kind of aloof? They don't really care to, to, to connect with anybody. It's because they have all they need. They don't need any more. They're done. So nitrogen wants to get an octet. Carbon wants to get an octet. So they do that by sharing electrons. So carbon has to share one, two, three, four more electrons. And if you look around carbon, two, four, six, eight. That's why it has four bonds. So I have a question for you. How many electrons does each atom have around it? So oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon have eight electrons, and hydrogen has two electrons. So we talked about this in the last unit. H2O and H3 and CH4, they're called molecular formulas. And molecular formulas are for covalent compounds. They differ from ionic compounds that they're not the simplest ratio of atoms. So molecular formulas indicate what atoms are involved, but not how they're connected. Electron dot structures not only tell what atoms are involved, but they also give an idea of the connectivity. So on the next page, we'll talk some more about formulas. So molecular versus ionic, um, this is an important distinction. Um, last, in unit two, remember we had covalent and ionic nomenclature mixed together. It's very easy to mix the two. Like Once you learn one way, you want to name the other one the other way. So just keep, keep that in mind. That's why I, I go through this. Um, so... Molecular deals with covalent bonds, and that's, remember, that's sharing the care bearer way. And the second thing, you do not simplify. Do not simplify. Formula. Okay, on the other hand, ionic formulas, they have charges. Ions plus minus. That is the attraction. Okay? And then the second thing, it's the simplest ratio. Formula is the simplest ratio. All right, so let's look at some bonding patterns. Carbon is in group one, two, three, four. It's in group four. The electron dot structure, and the electron dot structure just shows valence 
electrons, so that's outer shell electrons. Um, so since it's in group four, it has four electrons. So the electron dot structure is going to look like this. Now you might say, why didn't you do it like this? Pair them up. You leave them unpaired as long as possible. So you have four different sides to put your electrons on. So whenever I'm doing an electron dot structure, I fill out one, two, three, four. And then if I had like five or six electrons to place, then I would start pairing them up. So because um, carbon has four electrons, it has four vacancies. So it will have, it will prefer to have four bonds. And um, organic chemistry. Sometimes people hear about organic, students hear about organic chemistry and they think, oh gosh, it's so bad. Organic chemistry is great. It's a lot of fun. I always loved organic chemistry. But the joke is, um, organic chemistry involves carbon. And carbon can only have four bonds. Four bonds and four bonds only. So the joke is, you can do organic chemistry if you can count to four. And to a large extent, that's true. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated, but getting an octet for carbon is very important. And what a lot of students like to do in organic chemistry is to put more than four bonds on carbon. And if you take Chem 122 with me, you'll find out that I have an alarm when that happens. Five bonds to carbon. No way. So anyways, I digress. Back to our bonding patterns. All right. Nitrogen is in group three. All right. Um, sorry, not group three. It's in group five. One, two, three, four, five. Um, it's going to have three bonds. That's what I was thinking. So the electron dot structure is going to have five electrons around it. So I like to put mine at the top. My paired electrons, you could put them on the side or the bottom. I'm just accustomed to that. And I didn't what I could have demonstrated for you is to pair them one, two, three, four, and then pair that fifth one at the top. So the number of bonds, the number of spots that nitrogen has is three. So remember that everybody wants to get that octet. Eight is great. All right, oxygen is in group six. So its dot structure will look like this. And I like to do my oxygens two paired at the top and bottom. You can do them however you want, as long as you have two paired and two unpaired. The number of bonds that oxygen prefers to have is two, because it wants that octet. All right, now X stands for any halogen. I mean fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. That's in group seven. So X will have seven electrons around it. So that means it will have one unpaired. So any halogen is going to have one bonding spot. Okay, and lastly, hydrogen is in group one. It has one electron. You have to be careful. Careful. So careful, only two electrons. So it's just going to have one bond. I have a lot of students who try to give hydrogen more electrons than hydrogen has, and they go over budget. They go into electron debt. <laughs> you didn't know that was possible, did you? It is. So remember we talked about diatomic elements. Um, just to review, diatomic elements are elements that exist with only two atoms present. So Hofbrinkle, remember these exist as twos. So, Hofbrinkel. All right, so let's draw the electron dot structure for fluorine. And fluorine is one of your Hofbrinkels. It's the Hof and Hofbrinkel, so that's F2. Um, so, if you go to your bonding pattern, fluorine is a halogen. That's what its electron dot structure looks like. So if I draw one fluorine, like so, and then I'll draw another fluorine here together. 
they can have eight electrons around them. So two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight. They're happy, they're sharing, caring, and that's covalent bonding. So I'm gonna teach you how to come up with electron dot structures for a little bit more complicated molecules. Fluorine is, is kind of simple, not like it's simple, not smart, but just a simple example of a molecule. Um, so let's go through. Um, we're going to practice with silicon tetrafluoride. I'm making you work for this one. What is the formula for silicon tetrafluoride? I can tell you what it's not. This is not silicon tetrafluoride. No, 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 no. No! This is the formula for silicon tetrafluoride. There you go. Okay, so what you need to do is to find the total number of valence electrons of all the atoms in the molecule. And so valence electrons are the outer shell electrons. And it's really easy to figure out how many valence electrons you have if you just look at group number. So um, silicon is in group four, so it's going to bring four electrons to the table. All right, fluorine is in group seven. Um, it's a halogen, so it's in group seven. But I have four fluorine, so it's going to be seven times four plus four. So seven times four gives you 28, plus four gives you 32 electrons. So this is the electron budget I was making reference to. Um, you cannot go over budget. There are no loans for electrons. <laughs> um, I guess you could go over budget, but you're not going to get your the structure correct. So do you know, no debt is possible with um, electron dot structures. All right. Um, so where do I go from here? It is important to know how many electrons you have. Um, like I said, students sometimes go over budget with these um, electrons and they use too many electrons and it's impossible. I mean, what they're drawing is just crazy. It's defying everything about chemistry. So um, tally up how many electrons you have first. Then you can start drawing and being more creative. So the second step is to draw a line between each pair of connected atoms to represent the two electrons in a covalent bond. You want to put the atom that has the lowest number of valence electrons in the center. So that will be your central atom. So um, let me write central atom equals lowest number of valence electrons. And then I'm going to put a little star here. Exception. <laughs> the exception would be hydrogen or halogens. Do not go in the center. And that's because they can only have one bond. All right. So between silicon and fluorine. So silicon has four, fluorine has seven. Um, silicon has the lowest number. So that's going to go in the center. And then you've got to figure out how many lines you need to draw. Well, that would be dictated by the number here. So you have four fluorines. You're going to have four lines coming off silicon. So it's going to be like this. Okay. So I'm going to recopy this. At this point, I have used two, four, six, eight electrons. So I've used eight electrons. I have, how many do I have remaining? 24 remaining. Okay. Um, so I want to give all of these atoms an octet. We don't have any minimalist here, hydrogen or hydrogen would be our 
minimalist one. So right now, silicon has two, four, six, eight electrons. That's great. It's got the octet. I'm going to add lone pairs to each peripheral atom, except for H. I'm going to highlight that. It's very important. OK, so I will add. So I have two here. I need to add six to this fluorine. So two, four, six. I'm going to do the same thing all around. And then I'm going to see how where I stand in my budget. Okay, so I have eight around this fluorine, eight around this fluorine, eight around this fluorine, eight around this fluorine. It looks great in terms of the octet rule. Now, eight times four gives me 32. So now I have used 32 electron, electrons, zero remaining. It looks great. Okay, place all remaining electrons on the central atom. So I don't have any to put on the central atom. There are times when you do have some remaining to put on the central atom. This happens a lot with nitrogen. Um, not applicable for us, but it does happen, happens with nitrogen. Okay. So on the next page, I have some practice problems. And um, I have CFCl2, CF2, CL2, and then NF3. I want you to tally up your electrons and try to figure out your central atoms. So hit pause, work on that, and then when you return, I will go over them. Okay, so for CF2, Cl2, I have 32 electrons. Um, the lowest number of electrons is carbon, so I'm going to put carbon in the center. And then I'm going to draw four lines. Why did I draw four lines? Because I have two, two plus two to put around carbon. So um, two fluorines, two chlorines does not matter where you put them. You could have your chlorines on top. You could have your fluorines on the bottom. I don't care, just as long as you have two fluorines and two chlorines. Now, I have used up eight electrons right now. I have 26 remaining. Sorry, 24 remaining. Um, so I'm going to fill in my electrons here. Give everybody an octet, and then I'm going to see where I stand in my budget. Okay, so I have 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 8 times 4, I have 32 electrons. And everybody has an octet. Everybody's happy. So that is the structure. Yours could vary based on where you put your chlorines and fluorines. That's fine. But everybody should have 8 around it. If you prefer, you can draw these lines as two dots. I'm not real picky about that. So I do have some students who prefer to do that. Okay, so now for nitrogen trifluoride. I have 26 electrons. My lowest number of valence electrons is nitrogen, so I'm going to put nitrogen at the center, and then three fluorines, fill in the fluorines. How did I know that it was three? Because I only have three listed here. A lot of times students will work on autopilot and they'll put four fluorines, but I don't have fluorine, four fluorines to work with. So right now I've given my peripheral atoms an octet, um, and so I have eight times three. I have 24 electrons. I have two more left to use. If you look at my central atom, I have two, four, six electrons around it. So nitrogen's sad. Nitrogen wants more electrons to be like the noble gases. So fortunately, you have electrons remaining in your budget, and you can put those electrons around nitrogen. And these when you have electrons like this, this is called a lone pair, lone pair electrons. Um, and all of these would be bonding pairs. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit later on in this lecture about um, polarity and figuring out if something 
is polar or nonpolar, and a lot of it has to do with the geometry, the molecular geometry. So you need to figure out how many bonding pairs and how many lone pairs you have. So this molecule would have three bonding pairs and one lone pair, and that would make it trigonal pyramidal. And you say, what? Yeah, I will explain that to you a little bit later. But it's always good to have a preview before I actually dive in. So I'm giving you a preview. You need to know what lone pair electrons are and bonding pairs are. So I wish this had moved, it was on, the, on page 19, but it's not. Um, so we're going to talk about polarity. Are the following compounds nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic? So on the next page, I will explain this. So we have F2, NaCl, and HCl. OK, so I asked for polar covalent, nonpolar covalent. Sorry. <laughs> and um, ionic. So which of these three is ionic? Well, sodium chloride is definitely ionic, if you got that very good. Now, the polar covalent and nonpolar covalent, and you're thinking, I have no idea what are you, what are you talking about. So it turns out that within a covalent bond, remember a covalent bond is sharing of electrons, there can be um, a difference in charge, if you will. So if you think about what polarity means, if you have a crowd that's really polarized, and I I stay away from politics. If you, if you haven't noticed in class, I do not discuss politics. But it's a great example. Um, so you will have, I mean, I often have students that are, they, their political views differ vastly. They are staunchly Democratic or they're staunchly Republican and they get into these conversations. And I will say, you know, we're going to stick to chemistry. <laughs> You can talk about that outside of class, but right now let's stick to chemistry. So if you've heard me say that, <laughs> right, that's what I do. But um, when you have somebody who has very democratic views and you have another person who has very Republican views, they're very polarized. They're, they could not, they can't meet in the middle. They are, couldn't, they're just very different. Um, and sometimes you have that when it comes to bonding. So I am bringing this back to chemistry. Um, so that, so when you have this with bonding, you have um, one atom that is very positively charged, and you have another atom that's very negatively charged. So it's almost like an ionic bond, but it's still a covalent bond. So it still occurs between two nonmetals. So polar covalent bonds are like a student, two students trying to discuss politics, one's a de very Democratic, the other is very Republican. There you go. Um, Nonpolar covalent is like two Democrats talking. There's really, they get, they, they see eye to eye on everything. Now I, I realize that even Democrats can have their disagreements, but um, for my example, that works out better. I will just stick with it. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, fluorine is F2F, right? This is what fluorine looks like. Now we're talking about this bond, whether it's nonpolar covalent or polar covalent. Fluorine and fluorine have the same electronegativity. What does that mean? The same political views. They have the same political views. They don't differ. They don't get into an argument. They don't, you know. So um, this is nonpolar covalent. I don't. This also works with relationships too, where you have, um, if you have two people that are really alike, they never get into any conflict. Where if you have two vastly different personalities, they get into conflict. They're you know they're it's they're more like a uh, polar covalent. So HCl looks like this. And it turns out that um, this bond is polarized. You have a Democrat and a Republican, very heated debate all the time. And um, so 
where one side is partially negative, one side is partially positive, and this is polar covalent. And I'm going to explain that in just a minute. Okay, so what makes a compound polar covalent? So there is an electro negativity difference between atoms. And um, I'll put difference as the triangle of delta. Sometimes you'll see me write that. So what is electronegative negativity? Um, I like to describe this as the greediness of an atom. Some atoms are really greedy. They want that electron density. So greediness of atom. So this is the ability of an atom to pull electron density to itself. Sorry, ability of an atom to pull electron density to itself. Okay, so I kind of mentioned this in Unit 2, but it always bears repeating. The trend of electronegativity on the periodic table. As you go from left to right and bottom to top, electronegativity increases. Fluorine is the most electronegative element. Okay, so if you look on, so you have your periodic table. Yeah, this is the side, and then you have this crazy periodic table, and you think, what in the world is this? Okay, if you look at this key, and sorry, this is kind of out of focus, but you get that, that top number on the right, that is the electronegativity. So if you look at fluorine, fluorine is 3.98. Hydrogen is 2.20. Acetane, yeah, AT is 2.2. So you can see it increases from bottom to top and from left to right. So we can use the electronegativity values to predict whether we have a nonpolar covalent compound a polar covalent compound, or an ionic compound. So when electronegativities between two atoms are the same, it is nonpolar covalent. Think F2. When they differ by, I'm going to put 0.4 to 2.0, it's polar covalent, think HCl. And if they differ by more than two units, so, and I'm going to put this value 2.0 plus, it's ionic. So, we're going to look these values up just to prove this to ourselves. So look up the value for hydrogen and chlorine. You're going to have to use the funky side of your periodic table. This is the only time you will use this side of your periodic table. So for everything else, you're going to go back to the normal side. But if you find yourself completely lost and like, what am I looking at? Probably on the wrong side of the periodic table. It's okay to be on the wrong side of the periodic table when you're looking up electronegativity values. So for hydrogen... The electronegativity value is 2.20, chlorine 3.16. The electronegativity difference between this, 3.16 minus 2.20, you end up with 0.96. Go to your key up here, it's between 0.4 and 2.0. So this is polar covalent. Okay, F and F, I don't even have to look them up because they're the same, but just just to show that 3.98. So 
So the electronegativity difference is zero, so it's nonpolar covalent. All right, Na and Cl. I see metal to nonmetal, so I think ionic, but I'm going to prove it to myself by looking up this value. Sodium is 0.93, and chlorine is 3.16. The electronegativity difference is 3.16 minus 0.93. And if you're asking how do I know which one is first, I just always try to come up with a positive number or take the absolute value so you, of your answer. Um, Okay, so you get 2.23, that's definitely greater than 2, makes it ionic. Okay, so we're not going to look at this one. Um, I want to look at the bonds between carbon and lithium. So tell me the electronegativity difference between that. So carbon is... 2.55, lithium is 0.98, the electronegativity difference is 1.57. So this is a polar covalent bond. All right, so moving on. How can you tell if a molecule is polar or nonpolar? Now, I want to clarify. We were talking about bonds just a second ago. Now we're talking about molecules. Big difference. So I'm saying I have a bottle of methanol, or I have a bottle of ethanol, or I have a bottle of water, or I have a bottle of hexane. Which of these is polar? Which of these is nonpolar? How do you tell? So let's, I'm going to go through a little explanation and then we'll, we'll learn how to predict if something's polar or nonpolar. The reason this is useful is that like dissolves like. So polar compounds like polar compounds, nonpolar compounds like nonpolar compounds. So if you've ever had oil, and water, what happens when you try to mix them together? They don't like each other, right? Do not mix, and it's not, it's a solid line, right? So oil is nonpolar, water is polar, so they do not mix. Now, if you mix, if you try to mix water with ethanol, and you think, what is ethanol? Ethanol is alcohol that you drink, like vodka, whiskey, all these different things. Does it mix? Yes, it mixes. The reason it mixes is because water is polar, ethanol is polar. Okay, so HCl is polar. When you place the molecule HCl in an electric field, they orient themselves in a certain fashion. Okay, so we were talking about polar covalent bonds, and we learned that HCl had a polar covalent bond. Um, remember that Cl was, let me look at my numbers, 3.16 and 2.20. The larger this number, this electronegativity number is, that means the more greedy it is. So it attracts electron density to itself. So I'm going to put a lowercase delta and a negative sign. That means it has a partial negative. Partial negative. And then I'm going to put a partial positive on hydrogen. This means a partial positive. Okay? So this molecule, when you place it in an electric field, it's going to align so that the positives align with the negatives and the negatives align with the positives. So it's going to orient itself this way. So we'll always do that because of the polarity, because HCl is polar. So valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, that's a mouthful, Vesper, 
that's what we call it, helps predict whether molecules will be polar or nonpolar. Okay. So, I have this big table, and you think, my gosh, what is she going to make us do? All right, this table helps you determine molecular shape. So remember when I was talking about NH3 and the bonding pairs and the number of lone pairs? This helps us. So how do I predict if a molecule will be polar? There is a difference in electronegativity of the atoms and bonds. So you have polar bonds. So this is, remember when we talked about polar covalent. The molecule is not symmetric. Look at the shape. See table. Okay, so um, let's go through these examples so I can m clarify. This is a this is probably one of the more difficult things that we cover in Chem 100, um, predicting whether a molecule will be polar or nonpolar. It is not a required skill for Chem 122, which is the principles of chemistry. It is required in general chemistry, and it's a big part of general chemistry. So I have included it in this course because a lot of students who go on to general chemistry 1 and general chemistry 2 do not have a firm background in this. So if you're going on to the principles of chemistry, just bear with me, you know, you, you'll get this. You guys are bright. You can do chemistry. Um, it's gotten such a bad reputation, and it's so much of your success in chemistry, I feel strongly depends on your first impression of chemistry, your first instructor, if you will. So um, hang with me here. All right. So how do you predict if a molecule will be polar? There's an electronegativity between difference between the atoms and bonds. So polar covalent. So I like to try to simplify this as much as possible. So is it polar covalent question mark? If it is, mark the check marks. Um, check box. If the molecule is not symmetric, then it will be polar. So these two criteria have to be met in order for a molecule to be polar. Water meets that. Ethanol meets that. Methanol meets that. Hexane doesn't. Okay. So let's look at BCL3, which is boron trichloride. So in order to figure out if it's polar or nonpolar, you have to draw out the Lewis structure or the electron dot structure. So we have 3 plus three, uh, 7 times 3. So you have 24 electrons. Okay, so your central atom is going to be boron. Three lines. Give everybody an octet. And when you've completed that, you see I have used up my electrons. I can't go over budget. Boron does not get a lone pair. Boron's weird like that. All right, my first question to you, does it have polar bonds? Look up the difference in electronegativity. Boron is 2.04. So BCl, boron is 2.04. Chlorine is 3.16. Yes, it does have polar bonds. The molecular geometry. Okay. It has 1, 2, 3, 3 bonding pairs, 0 non-bonding pairs. So it has a total number of 3 electron pairs around the central atom. Its electron pair geometry is trigonal planar. And the number of bonding pairs is 3. And the number of lone pairs is 0. So it's trigonal planar. So trigonal planar um, looks like Knowing the shapes of this is not as important as you might guess. It's just knowing whether they're symmetrical or not. Um, so is it symmetrical? Yes. Okay. So there's a difference in electronegativity. Is it symmetric? Yes. So it has to be unsymmetrical. So it cannot be symmetrical in order to be polar. 
So this is a nonpolar molecule. And if another way to think about this is you're looking at the overall movement of this molecule. Think of this as a tug of war. You have these teams competing. Chlorine is competing against boron. Chlorine is competing against boron. So it's they're pulling and they're pulling, but they're not going to be moving anywhere because their net inner their net forces are canceling out because of the symmetry of the molecule. So if one of these was vastly different, if you had a different atom here, if you had a fluorine, for instance, then you would have polar possibly. So, but we don't get into molecules that complicated. Um, so let's look at H2O. The electron dot structure for H2O looks like this. And verify. So you have two, it's one plus six. So you have eight electrons. Oxygen is the central atom. You do not give the peripheral atoms um, electrons because they're hydrogen. But you do give the central atom two more. So this has two bonding pairs, two lone pairs. Um, does it have polar bonds? Oxygen, hydrogen. Oxygen 3.44. Let me do green. 3.44. Hydrogen's 2.20. So it has an electronegativity difference greater than 0.4. That's our. So yes, it is polar covalent. The molecular geometry. You're going to look for. This has four electron pairs around it. So I'm going to go here four. And I have two bonding pairs, two lone pairs or non-bonding pairs. It's going to be bent. So bent looks like the way I've drawn it. it. If these hydrogens were exactly opposite each other, then you would have a symmetrical molecule. But it's not symmetrical. So that's why it's polar. Okay. So for any quiz or exam concerning polarity, I would provide you with this table. I don't expect you to memorize this table. Be aware if you're going on to General Chemistry 1, you must have this table memorized. It's not going to be given to you. Okay, so on the next page, I have kind of a cheat sheet. The following molecular geometries will always give rise to nonpolar molecules when all the substituents are the same around the central atom A. Basically, what I'm saying is these are all the symmetrical groups or symmetrical geometries, as long as this X is the same. So I have examples below it. All right. Um, so very quickly. The questions are the following compounds, polar or nonpolar. You see BH3. You look up here. Hey, that's just like this. This is symmetrical, so it's going to be nonpolar. So I don't even have to go through um, the polar covalent bonds, drawing out the electron dot structure. Don't have to worry about it. Let's see. NF3, um, trigonal plane. That is not the same. Boron and nitrogen are not the same. So I can't say it's nonpolar right away. All right, go to CF4, um, and that's CF4. Hey, that's going to be symmetrical, so it's nonpolar. So right away, I can eliminate two of the five as just being nonpolar because of this table. So this is a handy thing to memorize, especially when you go on to Chem 1. Um, if you think you're going on to medical school, taking the MCAT, this is a very common question on the MCAT exam where they try to trick you with some that are symmetrical. But if you're wise, you know that's not true. Okay, so for the rest of these, you are going to have to draw out the electron dot structure, look at the bonds, see if they're polar or nonpolar, and then look at the symmetry. So I want you to hit pause and do that. And if you're overwhelmed by this task, just take it step one step at a time. Electron dot diagram. Look at the bonds, then do the polarity, or then do the geometry. 
Okay, so NF3, here's the electron dot structure. There is a difference between electronegativity between these. So you have a polar covalent bond. And then the geometry, you have three bonding pairs, one lone pair. So it comes out to be trigonal pyramidal, which is unsymmetrical. It's not one of these listed above. So it comes out to be polar. Okay, we already determined CF4 as nonpolar. Water is going to look like this. There is a difference. It is polar covalent, and it's unsymmetrical, so it's polar. Um, four, you have um, polar covalent. It's unsymmetrical. That makes it polar. So in order for a molecule to be polar, it has to be have polar covalent bonds, and it has to be unsymmetrical. So think of it as a tug of war. If you have those polar covalent bonds and it's symmetrical, they're not going to do anything. They're not going to result in any net movement with that tug of war. Okay, so that concludes our last lecture for Unit 3. If the last lecture I have done is overwhelming, be sure you do your homework problems and ask me questions in class. We will go over a lot of these. And again, for um, polarity, I will give you the table, so you don't need to memorize the table. But in the future, you will. Hopefully, it will be easier since you're familiar with it. All right. Until next time, study hard.